Welcome to episode 138 of the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I'm Ashley Scott Myers, screenwriter and blogger over at sellingyourscreenplay.com. Today I'm interviewing Mark Allen. He's a screenwriter who lives in Washington State and has still managed to find some success with his screenplays. Like a lot of my guests, he started out by shooting a super low budget feature film and since then he has sold and optioned a few scripts to various producers. So stay tuned for that interview. If you find this episode valuable, please help me out by giving me a review in iTunes or leaving a comment on YouTube or retweeting the podcast on Twitter or liking it on Facebook. These social media shares really do help spread word about the podcast, so they're very much appreciated. Any websites or links that I mention in the podcast can be found on my blog in the show notes. I also publish a transcript with every episode in case you'd rather read the show or look at something later on. You can find all the podcast show notes at www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash podcast. And then just look for episode number 138. If you want my free guide, How to Sell a Screenplay in Five Weeks, you can pick that up by going to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. It's completely free. You just put in your email address and I'll send you a new lesson once per week for five weeks along with a bunch of bonus lessons. I teach the whole process of how to sell your screenplay in that guide, how to write a professional log line and query letter, how to find agents, managers, and producers who are looking for material. Really is everything you need to know to sell your screenplay. Just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. So now let's get into the main segment. Today I'm interviewing screenwriter Mark Allen. Here is the interview. Welcome Mark to the Selling You Screenplay podcast. I really appreciate you coming on the show with me today. Well, thank you for having me. It's very exciting for me to be able to, to talk about my craft. Perfect. So maybe we can just um, back it up and we can talk about your background a little bit and kind of just bring us through, you know, your childhood, you know, some of your work experiences and then to the point where you decided to become a screenwriter. OK, um, I was born in a small town, very small farming community in East Texas, Jacksonville, Texas. Mm -hmm. um, I was raised in the 60s and, and early 70s in that that kind of uh, idyllic uh, Andy Griffith Mayberry type thing where everyone was nice, kids could play out, you know, uh, at night and you never had to worry about them being, you know, kidnapped or murdered or anything like that. Uh, it, it was an idyllic childhood. I can't, uh, I, I can't say anything other than that. Um, graduated high school, 1980. Um, but to backtrack that I had, um, I had shown, uh, an early affinity for the horror movies of the 30s and 40s and the science fiction, uh, specifically the big bug movies of the 50s. And then I was a teenager in the early 70s. So a lot of the Hammer horror and a lot of the, the AIP, American International horror, uh, Count Yorga, Vampire, Blackula, and movies like this, uh, the giant spider invasion. The, these were the movies that I grew up seeing, and they influenced me greatly. Mm -hmm. um, joined the military, and uh, I became a Navy hospital corpsman. And uh, as I went through my career, I um, I became a an, a field medical service technician, which. Uh, uh, for for someone who doesn't know what that is, uh, think of me as a battlefield medic. And uh, I was with the Marines. Uh, the Marines get all of their medical support from the from the Navy. So the, the Navy hospital corpsman goes out into the field with the Marines um, and provides medical support for direct combat operations. And uh, so I was doing that, went a few places, did a few things, uh, participated in, in a few activities, if you want to call them that. Um, but all through my career, uh, I had wanted to be a writer. I had grown up thinking that I would uh, become a novelist. You know, I thought I'd... Uh, in the 70s, I thought I'd grow up to be like the next Stephen King or something like that. 
And the dream got sidetracked by my military career. And in 1995, I was going through a divorce and um, I was laying on a rack in the in the barracks at Camp Pendleton in California and I'm feeling sorry for myself really down and I asked myself <clears throat> what do I do now you know I had no idea um, and I'm a guy who needs to have something to do and it just came in crystal clear. It was a, the true definition of an epiphany. I could do anything I wanted. So the next question became, well, what do I want? What gave me pleasure? What gave me joy when all this, before all this happened when I was a kid? And it came back to the writing. But I didn't really want to be a novelist anymore. And one night, a bunch of the guys in the barracks had rented a bunch of movies for the weekend. And one of the movies that they rented was Basic Instinct. And, you know, we're sitting there watching the movie. And, of course, all the guys are going nuts and hooting and hollering over Sharon Stone and all this. And I'm sitting there watching the movie and uh, with all all deference to Joe Esterhouse, I'm watching this movie going, guys, this movie's a piece of shit. Oh, I, I'm sorry. Can I say that? Yeah, yeah, sure. Oh, sure. Okay. And uh, sorry, I didn't even think. And, you know, they were just going, what are you talking about? Look at her. And I'm like, guys, there's no story here. And it just, it made me mad. Uh, I mean, I actually got angry. I felt like the filmmakers had ripped everybody off because whenever the story got up to a point where there was nowhere to go, they would just throw in another sex scene. They'd throw in more nudity or they'd throw in somebody getting killed. It was, a, in my opinion, it's a mess. And it got me mad. And I said, you know what? I can do that, and I can do it better. And uh, so I went out to a bookstore, and I bought a couple of books on screenwriting. And that's kind of what got the ball rolling for me. Uh, I was still active duty. I still had about six years left on, on my career before I could retire. But, you know, I, I read all the standards. I read Sid Field. Uh, I read the elements of screenwriting, which had been a uh, a textbook that was used at UCLA Film School. Uh, uh, script writing by J. Michael Straczynski. In fact, I still have my copy of script writing is right here on my desk. I'm tapping my finger on it. Mm -hmm. um, I went to a, a couple of seminars that were put on by the Learning Annex. I don't know if Learning Annex is even still around anymore, but... Back in the 90s, you could get these little brochures at the bus stations with all these classes that you could take on everything. I mean, from getting your real estate license to underwater basket weaving. I mean, they had classes for it. And I took a couple of those seminars on, on screenwriting so I could get my basics. What is a slug line? How does a slug line look? And that kind of thing. And I just went from there. And... Uh, at the time, made for basic cable movies were very popular. They often starred Lorenzo Lamas or someone like that, Mark Singer and people like that. And um, they always seemed to be very sultry thrillers, very um, erotic. And what I didn't realize at the time was they were all modern versions of film noir. And... Uh, so I started writing a script called Ladies Man, uh, which was this mystery. Of, and, and I was writing it for cable. I didn't know that's what I was doing, but that's what I was doing. And um, I wrote this script, and it was just god-awful. God-awful. 
but I wrote a hundred pages of screenplay. I wrote it in proper format. And even though looking back on it now, the script was just God awful. At the time, it was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen in my life, you know? And um, after that first script, that was it. I was hooked. I was off and running. And it was just script after script after script after script after script, writing, 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 Um, you know, stopping and going off on deployments and this and that and the other with my job. Um, But I was always writing. I wrote every day. Uh, Even if I wrote out in longhand on a, on a spiral notebook, uh, because there were times when I did not have access to a computer, but I wrote every day. Writers write. People sometimes will ask me, um, what does it take to be a writer? And I said, it, I will tell people, it takes the seat of your ass to the seat of a chair. You don't have to be rich. You don't even have to have a, a computer. You can go buy a buck fifty pen and a three dollar uh, college notebook. Sit down and start writing. Now you're a writer. The only the only thing you got to do now is get the technology so you can share your writing you know but it but it's all there Mm -hmm. and um you know writers write uh and still to this day you know that was 1995 now we're in 2017 it's been 22 years and i still force myself to put the seat of my ass to the seat of a chair every single day Mm -hmm. seven days a week even if it's even if it's only for an hour so you had, it sounds like in 1995, you wrote this first script and then you said you just kept on writing. You had five or six more years in the military. How many scripts did you write in that time period, that five or six year time period before you got out? Probably about 10 or 12. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So then take us through that period. So now you're, you're finished with your military career. Mm-hmm. What were your first steps to actually start to get some of these scripts produced? Um, <clears throat> I had become... I had become adept at writing query letters, and uh, I had figured that the the query letter for a screenplay was actually quite similar to the query letter that you would send a literary agent regarding a novel. So I took that template and just started, you know, creating a log line, then a three paragraph synopsis you know, one paragraph to set up each act. And then I would leave it with some kind of a cliffhanger. I would never exactly say what the end was. Because if I did, what's the point in reading it? So, and um, I would send out query letters, man, everywhere. Every agency, every producer, every production company, um, every literary manager, you know, anyone who said that they would be open to an email, I sent emails. Now, at that time, in the late 90s and early 2000s, a lot of them um, were not online yet, so you had to send actual hard copy query letters with self, a stamp, self-addressed envelope and all that. And I did that. And at first... I would either get nothing or I would just get, we don't accept unsolicited material to which it just drove me nuts. Cause it's like, well, why did you say in this, in this list or in this book directory that I paid a lot of money for, why does it say that you accept unsolicited material? If you don't accept unsolicited material, that, that never made any sense, but I kept going, kept going. And I was out of the military, and by this time I was starting to get some screenplays read at companies, and they'd say, yeah, it's great, but we don't really have a place for it on our slate, but send us your next one. Send us something else, you know, and um, 
it just got very frustrating. And I, and, uh, I just got to a point where I said, you know what? I'm tired of waiting for other people to give me permission to do my job. So, uh, I'm a, I'm a devotee of Roger Corman, the great, uh, low budget filmmaker. And I had read his autobiography, which I recommend to everyone. It's called how I made a hundred movies in Hollywood and never lost a dime. Read it. It's a master class in low budget filmmaking. Um, I had also read a couple of other books specifically um, from from Real to Deal by Dove S.S. Simons. And that was the book that breaks everything down into the nuts and bolts of what you must do to go from a concept in your head to a movie on the screen. And that was the book that that really changed my life because it said, Hey, even I can do this. There's a blueprint. All I got to do is follow this. So that's what I did. I wrote a 95 page script, uh, a teen slasher movie that's set in the desert called delirium. And I wrote it specifically to be made fast and cheap down and dirty. I raised $9,000 nine thousand dollars i cast it i got a crew to work it and we went out into the desert between san diego where i was living and el centro and we shot that movie we did get this we did 95 pages of script in nine days for nine thousand dollars we got it in the can on time and on budget. <laughs> now, that's low. That's Roger Corman style filmmaking, you know. And uh, we got it done. And then I spent the next year editing the the film because I had to do it myself. I couldn't I couldn't find anyone to edit it for me, and I didn't have the money. Uh, so, <laughs> what I did. Uh, San Diego uh, has a, a uh, an adult education district, right? And I would sign up for these free classes just so I could go in and have access to their computers because their computers had uh, Final Draft, not Final Draft, I'm sorry, Final Cut 5 on them. And, you know, the... The professors knew what I was doing, and they were cool with it. I'd explain it to them at the first. I'd sit at the back of the room with headphones on, Mickey Mouse-style headphones, and an external hard drive. I would plug in, and while they're doing their class, I'm back there editing my movie. <laughs> and uh, it took me a year to do it, but I got it done. And then we started approaching... Um, various distribution outlets and I made the worst mistake I could ever make. I signed with the first company that offered me a contract. That was York entertainment. They are now defunct. Uh, but they had, they had worldwide media rights to it. And it got released in North America, uh, it got, and according to their uh, financial reports that I would get every few months, um, it got released in places like it got released in Mexico, Brazil, it got released in the UK, Russia, which was a, a hot new market at the time, kind of like China is now. It got released in Hong Kong, Japan, Indonesia, Thailand, you know, it, it, got, it got put into about 20 territories worldwide. Mm -hmm. And, um, but the way the contract had been written and I did not know any better and I did not have an entertainment attorney at the time, the way the contract was written, 
essentially it gave them license to steal. I never saw a penny for that movie. Never saw a nickel. Was never able to pay my investors back. Was never able to pay um, uh, my cast or my crew because every we all worked on deferred pay. I didn't. I didn't put any money in my pocket. In fact, about four thousand dollars of the budget actually came out of my pocket. Uh-huh. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, first movie I got completely ripped off. Um, but it got my name out there. And I got some momentum, and I was going to do this next movie uh, called Early Grave. And I was going to shoot that in East County in San Diego. And uh, I was getting money lined up, and I was going to shoot it on about a $150,000 budget um, because I was going to pay my cast and crew. And I was going to make sure that I paid myself this time around. I, I learned from my mistake. And um, then, you know, the bottom of the economy fell out in 08. And all that money that had been pledged to me just, <laughs> it was just gone. And um, so Early Grave didn't wind up getting made until years later. Um, it was shot in late 2011 and I co-produced on that. I, I did not direct it. Um, I brought the script to the table and I co-produced because I was going to help with, uh, trying to find a distributor. And, um, so it gets made and it's a much better film. Uh, how did, and let's talk about that for a minute, though. How did you actually find the people, the director, the producer? How did you find those people that actually made the movie? Well, um, the director, Kevin DeBacco, and I uh, had been friends for a while because we had both been burned by York Entertainment. And we kind of bonded over that. And uh, he's an Air Force veteran. And so, you know, we bonded over that, you know, brothers in arms and all that kind of thing. How did you actually physically meet him, though, um, through this York Entertainment? Like they had like a Christmas party and you guys just happened to meet there? Actually, he gave me a call. Uh, I, have, I have never s stood in the same room with Kevin DeBacco. Okay. Because uh, he, he's in uh, Portland, Maine. And I'm, I'm still here on the West Coast. I'm, I'm currently in lovely Port Orchard, Washington. But um, between emails and, and phone calls and stuff, we said, yeah, let's let's do something together. And he had another script from an, another writer that he was considering at the time. And I, I pitched him early grave. I just pitched the log line, didn't tell him anything else. And uh, he said, send the script. So I emailed it. And less than 24 hours later, he called me back, and it was on a weekend, I remember. He called me back and said, this is the script we have to do. And I said, well, what about this other script from this other writer? And he goes, nah, we're doing yours. <laughs> and I said, okay. So they hired, um, they hired cast out of Boston and out of New York. And uh, and some of the cast has actually gone on to to higher profile stuff, which is always wonderful to see. And they went out to an island off the coast of Maine, Peaks Island, and they shot the they shot the movie there on location over a I think they shot over a two week period. And um, it's funny though, uh, although I like the final product, it wasn't what I wrote. Um, I wrote a horror film. What he made was a thriller. Uh, on By blood level and gore, I wrote Friday the 13th, the original. He shot the original Halloween, which, you know, has no blood in it at all. Mm -hmm. So I wrote Friday the 13th, but he shot Halloween. 
and that's that's the movie that went out and uh and that's an important lesson to learn for all screenwriters um once you get your script out there and someone takes it on to make it into a movie what you wrote is not necessarily what's going to get shot the story that you saw in that in that little cinema in your head is not going to be the story that winds up on the DVD. Um, now, with some scripts that I have, that would be fine. You know, I can I can just sell them, take the money, and and walk away. But I have some scripts that are actually very important to me. They're personal. They're precious. And um, on those, I try to attach myself as a co-producer or, or as a director so that I can ha at least have my fingers in the pie when it comes to creative input. Because as a screenwriter... Once you sell your script, it's no longer yours. They can do anything they want with it. Maybe you wrote a political thriller. They turn it into a romantic comedy. You know, I mean, it, it happens. Uh, just ask Joss Whedon about what happened with his original Buffy the Vampire Slayer screenplay, the feature film. Uh, yeah, they, they took a horror movie and they turned it into a teen comedy that just happened to have vampires in it, you know? Yeah. So yeah. It, it happens. You, the only way you can keep any kind of creative control is to attach yourself as a, as a producer or something so that at least your voice continues to be heard. Mm -hmm. I want to jump back just real quick. Um, you had mentioned um, trying to raise one hundred fifty thousand dollars for early grave and raising the nine thousand dollars for delirium. Maybe you could just. I do get emails from people saying, "Hey, I want to do my own film. How can I raise money?" Are there some practical tips, or maybe you can even just share your story of how you went out and actually tried to raise that money? Because I think just sharing your story might give some people ideas about how they could potentially raise money for their films. Okay, on uh, on early grave, uh, I wanted to raise ten but I could only raise nine and no, you're talking about delirium on delirium. delirium. Yes. Yeah. Delirium. Sorry. And, um, nobody, and I mean, nobody wanted to put a nickel into it. Um, for screenwriters who want to produce or direct, no investor wants to be first money in. They want to see that there's already money in the in the escrow account. They want to see that someone else believes in you, especially if you're a first time director or first time producer. They want to see that that someone else believes in you, even if that someone else is yourself, because the, the question that I got asked by every person, whether they invested or not. They asked me if I had skin in the game. Now, there's a there's a rule in Hollywood that says never, ever invest your own money. Always get other people's money. And it's a good it's a good practice, but it's it's a practice that gets broken all the time, especially at the independent and at the micro budget level. Um, you, you need to have some cash in the till to show investors, even if it's your own money, because then you're saying, I believe in myself and I'm willing to put my money where my mouth is. And that's important. Mm -hmm. So how did you find people to pitch, especially on something like Early Grave, where you're talking about raising 150000 How did you find people to actually pitch? And was it just friends and family, friends of friends? Um, who were you actually pitching and saying, hey, will you kick in money? Um, I started with friends and expanded out to friends of friends. Whenever I talked to somebody, if they said, no, this isn't something I can do right now, 
I would say, okay, do you know anybody who might be interested in, in something like this? Because everybody has that crazy uncle or that friend from college or whatever who will always invest in these these high risk harebrained schemes, right? So you go talk to the crazy uncles, you go talk to the crazy friend from college, you go talk you know, you talk to anybody who will give you ten minutes of their time, mm-hmm. and eventually you will find someone who's willing to put money up and then you ask them the same question. Hey, you happen to know anybody, any business associates, any friends who might be interested in kicking in for this? Invariably, they will say, actually, yeah, I got this crazy friend that I was in college with (laughs) and it it just keeps going. Um, In searching out, um, high net worth individuals. I started talking with um, real estate agents and uh, because real estate agents know people who are wealthy because they sell houses for a living, Mm -hmm. you know? And I found this one agent who again, wasn't an air force veteran. So he he was willing to give me 10 minutes. And I went in and and pitched him. And uh, he said, well, I I never invest in anything in entertainment because it's such a high risk. However, (laughs) I know some people. And that's that's how it happened. And uh, it just went from one person to the next to the next. And before I knew it, I had met, you know, five, six people who were willing to kick in 25 grand each, you know. Mm-hmm. And so that was great. Um, I was setting up the escrow account uh, to put the money into so that nobody could touch it until we were actually ready to shoot. Uh, that way they knew that I wasn't going to take their money. And I was getting ready to cast. I already had my technical crew. The the crew from Delirium was going to work on Early Grave. Uh, I was just going to cast some different people. And then the economy collapsed. The housing bubble burst. And, uh, you know, there was no money. All, all of my investors backed out. Uh, the money, like I said, within less than a week, when they realized as they were realizing how bad it really was, the money was just gone. Yeah. 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 So let's move on to um, isolation and talk about that one. Um, Talk about that film. How did you um, get that one, that script sold or get it to a producer who's willing to make it? Um, Early grave. I'm sorry. Isolation. uh, I had written about 2010 and it was a finalist uh, at the Shriekfest Horror Film Festival. Out of a out of a field of over two thousand screenplays, Isolation made the top ten. And uh, although it, it didn't win ultimately on awards night, it did not win. But uh, it was still the finalist for best horror screenplay. And I tried getting that around, and. Nobody cared that I'd made the finals at Shriek Fest. They couldn't have cared less. So I'm like, okay, what am I going to do now? I knew it was a bigger picture than what I could do on my own. And so I tried getting it set up, and nothing happened. Two or three years go by, and suddenly, you know, nothing has happened with it, and nothing's happening with my career. Early Grave wound up being a bust. And uh, although I thought it was a good movie. Um, and I'm at a point where I'm saying, you know what? I've been beating my head against this wall long enough. Technology has caught up in the publishing realm. I'll just write novels and self publish through Amazon and through Kindle. And uh, price it where people can afford it and where I can make a a reasonable amount of money on the deal. 
And I'll just take all these scripts that I've written over the years and I'll, I'll just novelize them, man. I'll, I'll have this deep, deep well of material that I can go to. And then in 2014, uh, I was diagnosed with stage four throat cancer. And everything came to a screeching halt. Everything. Uh, at that point, it was simply about staying alive. Because uh, my cancer was very aggressive, and uh, I have a can or I ha well I have a cancer that is unique to men, and only has a twenty three survival percentage rate, twenty three percent survival at twelve months. Think about that for a minute. I'm at twenty five months right now, uh, which I'm you know pretty happy about. As you was to say. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So along the way, getting back to isolation, uh, along the way, I had written a uh, another screenplay called Restitution, which was not a horror film. Uh, it's a psychological thriller. And I actually sold it. I mean, actual they actually paid me with a check that didn't bounce. Um, I sold it. Uh, to some fellas uh, at Terror Films Incorporated. Uh, uh, the guys that run it are, are uh, Joe Dane and Jim Clock. That's Clock with a K. And Miles Feinberg. And uh, they're all Hollywood insiders, veteran veteran people. And uh, they wanted to start a kind of a side company for themselves that would deal strictly with horror and thrillers and darker material. And I pitched him restitution. They read the script. They liked it and they paid me for it and I sold it. And how did you hook up with them? Like how did you, how did they even get on your radar that you knew to even pitch to them? They had put something on a, on a posting site called ink tip. Okay. And, uh, I had simply responded to that and, um, I didn't know it at the time, but they told me later that restitution was the only script out of the 450 that they had requested out of that listing where all three of them agreed, yes, this is the script. So uh, restitution is, I sold it in October of 2014. Uh, it's still in development uh, with them from, from what I understand, and I haven't spoken with them in a while, but... Uh, you know, simply because we're, you know, they're busy with their stuff. I'm busy with mine. Um, but supposedly they're looking to shoot it sometime in 2017. So, and it was an interesting setup. I wanted to do an exercise for myself, a creative exercise. And uh, I wanted truly one location. And so I picked the cliched cabin in the woods. Right. But it's a one room cabin. So it's all in one place. And the whole movie, the whole screenplay takes place inside, outside and immediately around that cabin. Um, people drive in on a road, they leave on the road. But, you know, there's no there's no other location like at a post office or at a grocery store or in a nightclub. None of that. It's all right there at this cabin. And I wanted to see how I could create tension and suspense using as few characters as possible. And <laughs> what I wound up doing with restitution was I have four four characters in the entire script and over 50% of the script is just two people. The other two are people who, who actually drive up and come to the cabin to interact with someone in the cabin, you know, and, um, they loved, you know, they, uh, the, the folks at terror films, loved the script and they made an offer to, to buy it. And I took the offer mm -hmm. and, um, 
very soon after that, I got a call. I was still living in San Diego at the time, recovering from this cancer. Um, I got a call from a, um, an old friend of mine who was in Los Angeles and, um, uh, he'd been an actor for a long time and he decided to kind of, you know, shift gears in his career and he wanted to be a literary manager and a, and a producer. And he called me up, told me what he was doing and asked if I might be interested in signing on as a client. So it's like, hmm, let me think here. Hollywood representation? No Hollywood representation. Hmm, let me weigh that a minute. Uh, yes. <laughs> so I, I signed with him. His name is Chaz Shearer. Uh, he's my manager and my business partner now. Um, he owns the, the company AJ Quote Agis Entertainment. It's a Latin term that means do what you do. And uh, he took the script. And, and this is for isolation now. Yeah, this is for isolation. He took the script and he read it and said, holy crap, Mark, uh, let me send this out to, uh, to an actor friend I know. I want to get his take on it. And the actor friend that he knew um, is a fellow by the name of Todd Duffy. And if anyone has ever seen the movie Office Space, Todd Duffy was Bruce the Flair guy. He was the one that was always very high energy, highly kinetic, was was always, yeah, that's it, yeah. Hey, you guys, get a room, yeah. Uh, that was Todd Duffy. <coughs> Pardon me. And um, he read the script and got back in touch with Chaz. And according to Chaz, uh, Todd said, this is a kick-ass writer. This guy kicks ass and takes names. And um, so it went from there. And we had been dealing with a, a, an executive producer who was looking at getting money from some European sources to fund the script at about $20 million. Uh, the script itself could be done for less, but... A lot of it has to do with the level of actor that you get in it. And, you know, on, on the business side of things with budgets, you hit kind of an awkward place. If you get much over a million five, two million dollars, you start getting into this no man's land as far as distribution goes. You've got too much money invested to make your money back straight from direct to video, DVD and foreign sales but you haven't put enough money in to get a star who can open the movie and can justify a theatrical release. Now, once you start getting up into 10, 15, $20 million, then you're getting to a point where you can get a video star and a TV star. You get up around 20 million and you're looking at being able to get a movie star. Someone that if you want to see them, you have to go to a theater and plunk down your 12 bucks to go see them. And um, so our, our EP wanted to get uh, a particular actor that we had talked about, an Oscar winning actor, by the way. And um, that really didn't wind up leading anywhere. Um, she seemed to not quite have the connections that she said she did. But in the meantime, Chaz is working on these other projects. And we're talking projects that are being pitched now as we speak in Hollywood that have like 100, 150, 200 million dollar budgets. Hmm. I mean, historical dramas that are, you know, if you're going to make historical drama, that's the kind of money you have to you have to have to do them and do them right. And so he's still holding on to isolation because he's going to be attached to this big movie. 
because what happens is as soon as it hits the trades that this movie is a go, everybody on planet Earth in the movie business is going to be getting in touch with him because he's attached as a producer. They'll be getting in touch with him saying, what else do you have? Are you working on something else? Is there something that we could do together? At which point he's going to say, well, <laughs> I'm glad you asked. I have this, you know, $20 million project over here called Isolation. And, you know, we'd really like to be able to do something with that. So that's, that's where we are with Isolation. Um, I have not sold it. But I have been able to get uh, Hollywood representation. I have a literary manager. Um, I have an entertainment attorney now <laughs> that I'm a client with. Um, and that's where isolation is. We're, we're, right, we're right at that cusp where I think, I think realistically something's going to happen probably in the, by the end of the year. I think something's going to happen. So I'm curious, um, just to go circle all the way back from the beginning of the interview, um, you saw Basic Instinct and, and you thought, I can do better than that. Now that you've been through this process, do you look at your scripts and you say, yeah, I'm writing scripts better than Basic Instinct? Um, I'm writing scripts that are different from Basic Instinct. Um, I tend to write in the horror and the thriller and film noir and uh, science fiction, I tend to deal with really dark material. Uh, you know, I, I've, I've said before that no werewolf, no zombie, no vampire, nothing that I can put into a movie is ever going to be as horrifying or as terrifying as what I saw in real life when I was in the military. You know, uh, I'm not afraid of werewolves. I'm not afraid of witches or anything else. You know what I'm afraid of? I'm afraid of the evil that lives in the hearts and the psyches of human beings. I'm afraid of the horrors that we are capable of inflicting upon our own kind. You know, that's that's what scares me. So um, am I are my scripts better than basic instinct? No, I think they're just different because if I said I had a script bit better than basic instinct, I'd be saying that I'm a better screenwriter than Joe Esterhaus. And, um, I admire and respect Esterhaus who's no longer active screenwriting. I think he's doing novels these days. Um, what I admire and love about him is that, he he did it on his own terms. He got his movies made, and he got them made without going through countless rewrites after rewrites after rewrites and diluting the story t because he was getting script notes from you know some twenty two year old intern. You know, um, he got his movies made the way he wanted them made, and uh, that's what I'm. That's what I'm trying to do, um, which is why with isolation, uh, I am attached as a producer. And that's anyone who just wants to buy the script and not take me along with it uh, as a producer, producing with, with Chaz, that would be a non-starter. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll get up and walk out and we'll go, we'll go sell it to somebody else. Yeah, uh, yeah. Are any of your films, um, can people watch any of the films? Are any of them on Netflix, um, video on demand channels, anything like that? No, they're not. The only way to find, um, the only way to find, uh, early grave is to, um, is to buy it through Amazon. Now, what I recommend is, um, buy it used. Don't buy it from the, uh, from the distribution company, uh, Let's just say they and I don't see eye to eye on uh, <laughs> on certain key elements of distribution. Yeah, yeah. Um, so buy it used. You can get it. You can get it really cheap. You can get it for like you know a couple of bucks and have it shipped to you that way. Delirium. Um, the 
the distribution company has folded, all the rights have reverted back to me. And um, I've been busy with so much other stuff, I haven't really done anything with it. But um, I'm thinking of, of looking at YouTube and, and some other channels where maybe I could set it up to where, you know, people could pay a, a nominal fee, you know, like 99 cents or buck 99, something like that. Um, so that they can, so that they can see it. And that way I, I can at least get some money. Um, not that the money would, would stay with me, um, per the contracts that I signed with the investors all those years ago, uh, the investors get their money back first, plus a 20% premium. Um, then money after that has to be paid to the casting crew. Mm -hmm. After that, then I get paid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I just always like to wrap up these interviews by asking the guests to um, just share whatever you're comfortable with in terms of like a Twitter handle or a Facebook page, a blog, a website, anything like that, just so people can kind of get to know you better and potentially follow along with what you're up to. Oh, sure. Um, I'm on I'm on Facebook at you know Mark Allen. Uh, I'm uh, there's a picture of me on a sunny day with Mount Rainier behind me. You type in Mark Allen, you're going to see, you know, hundreds of people. But I'm the I'm the guy in a blue shirt, red hat, with Mount Rainier behind me. And it, you might narrow the search by typing in Port Orchard, Washington, because that's that's my uh, my location. I'm on LinkedIn, uh, and I'm also on Twitter uh, at Tinfoil Hat Prods, P R O D S. That's me. Perfect, perfect. I will round all that stuff. I'll put it in the show notes so people don't have to go um, searching through Facebook to find you. I'll find you. I'll put it in the show notes, um, and that'll all be set. Well, Mark, okay. interesting interview. You've got a great story. Um, I wish you continued success. Um, definitely let me know um, what happens with Isolation, and once that movie gets produced, I'd love to have you back on, and we can kind of talk about that experience as well. Oh, that'd be great because we're, we're, we've already got as much pre-production done as we can, we're, you know, all we're waiting on is the money, and we're, we'll be in pre-production after that. We're going to shoot on location in uh, in Texas, where I'm from, actually, about 30 miles down the road from where I was from where I was born and raised. Mm -hmm. Perfect, perfect. Yeah. Well, I, I appreciate it, Mark. Thank you very much for talking with me today. Believe me, it's been my pleasure. Anytime, anytime, anything perfect. I can do to help you, let me know. Sounds good. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. You have a good day. You too. Bye. Bye bye. I just want to mention two things I'm doing at Selling Your Screenplay to help screenwriters find producers who are looking for material. First, I've created a monthly newsletter that will be sent directly to producers. Every member of SYS Select can submit one logline per newsletter. I went and emailed my large database of producers and asked them if they would like to receive this monthly newsletter of pitches. So far, I have well over 350 producers who have signed up to receive it. These producers are hungry for material and happy to read scripts from new writers. So if you want to participate in this pitch newsletter and get your script into the hands of lots of producers, sign up at sellingyourscreenplayselect.com. Again, that's sellingyourscreenplayselect.com. And secondly, I've partnered with one of the premier paid screenwriting leads sites so I can syndicate their leads to SYS Select members. There are lots of great paid leads coming in each week from our partner. Recently, I've been getting 10 to 12 high quality paid leads per week. These are producers and production companies who are actively looking to buy material or looking to hire a screenwriter for a specific project. If you sign up to SYS Select, you'll get these leads emailed directly to you several times per week. These leads run, these leads run the gamut from produce, production companies looking for a specific type of spec script to producers looking to hire a screenwriter to write up one of their ideas. Producers are looking for shorts, features, TV, and web series pilots. It's a huge array of different type of projects that these producers are looking for. And these leads are exclusive to our partner and to SYS Select members, so you won't find them anyplace else. To sign up, go to sellingyourscreenplayselect.com. Again, that's selling your screenplay select.com. 
On the next episode of the podcast, I'm going to be interviewing Ben Creaseman. He's a director and screenwriter who recently shot his second feature film, a mystery thriller called Sunchoke. Ben started out, as many of my guests have, by just going out and shooting his own micro-budget feature film and then slowly building up. Some of the contacts he made shooting that first film definitely helped him land this second film. So keep an eye out for that episode next week. To wrap things up, I just want to touch on a few things from today's interview with Mark. Once again, I really hope you're finding these podcast episodes inspiring. Mark is just a normal guy who went out and started doing stuff, and slowly good things have started to happen to him. I think there are probably lots of people out there who listen to this podcast who are in a similar situation where they have a career outside of the entertainment industry. They watch movies. They love movies. They want to get into um, the business as a screenwriter. So I think he's a great template to, to look at. Um, he's a great example of kind of what you need to do. You know, he didn't have any connections in the industry. He didn't have lots of money or experience, but he still managed to go out there and complete a feature film all on his own. And I really think that's, at the end of the day, what it boils down to. Again, maybe you don't have to go out and shoot your own feature film. Maybe it's a matter of writing scripts and, and aggressively marketing your scripts, which is something else he seems to have done pretty well. Um, I talk about this a lot on the podcast. Obviously, selling your screenplay has a lead service, but there's a lot of other ways to market your script. Um, again, selling your screenplay has a lead service. We have our blast service. But you can also use all the other ways of, of marketing your scripts. Contests, there's tons of script contests out there. Those can potentially help you um, gain a little traction in the industry. Um, I talk about the blacklist often on the podcast. Um, that's another service where you can upload your script and potentially have producers find it. Inktip is another great service. I personally use it as a screenwriter. It's, it's similar to what we offer at Selling Your Screenplay. They have leads. They also have the ability to um, post, much like the blacklist, they have the ability to post a log line in, um, in, their serve, in their system, in their database, so producers can potentially find it. So there's really a plethora of ways social media there's really just numerous ways that you can get out there and market your script but there's just so many things you could be doing and I just think that's key that's what's inspiring at least to me um, hearing Mark's story he's just out there doing stuff whether it's networking whether it's making his own feature film um, that's what happens you know good things can happen when you just push stuff out into the world and let other people know that you're out there and um, you know this podcast is a big part for me this podcast is a big part of that piece of my own puzzle um, getting out there doing Doing something the podcast and I'm going to talk more about this when I go into my own um, sort of recap on my own feature film the pinch the podcast really in a lot of ways was what propelled that obviously raising a lot of money on Kickstarter came a lot through the podcast listeners but also just some of the connections that I made through the um, through the podcast um, my cinematographer Bernie he uh, met me through my podcast um, so there's just a lot of advantages to just getting out there and doing stuff again you don't necessarily have to start a podcast but think about what you could be doing Maybe it's shooting short films and entering them into film festivals. Maybe it's just writing a lot of scripts and marketing them aggressively. But you've got to get out there and interact. Just writing a script, sending it out to one or two contests, putting it on one or two services, that's probably not going to cut it. You've got to be aggressively out there, getting stuff out there, meeting people, networking, just getting into the scene. Um, and I think that's what Mark has really done a great job doing. Again, it's about maybe making a feature film get yeah, that might get you a little bit of traction it's about writing a lot of scripts entering them into contests getting them up on some of these um, services it's just about doing stuff um, as you do stuff and get out there people will take note and people will get to know you and you'll get to know them and that's really how you're going to build a career anyway that's the show thank you for listening